Good morning and welcome to the webinar. We're focusing on increasing the racial and cultural diversity of faculty and professionals in special education and school psychology. Tips for students from diverse backgrounds applying to doctoral programs. And my name is Shane Jimerson. I'm here this morning with Dr. Wong, Dr. Green, and Ms. Hinojosa. And so we'll have an opportunity for each of them, each of us to introduce ourselves in just a moment. And as noted, you're welcome to provide questions uh, during the time we'll respond. You can also feel free to email or follow up with us after this session. And we hope that this information will be valuable for each of you. So in terms of the agenda for this morning's session, we'll briefly begin with introductions in a moment. We'll highlight the importance of increasing diversity. We'll, we will refer to what is evaluated as uh, faculty are reviewing these application materials. The primary emphasis is on top tips for applying. So we'll give you a lot of uh, our perspective based on our experiences. And as noted, there'll be an opportunity for question and answers. So in terms of introductions, I can, uh, I, I can begin briefly and share that my name is Shane Jimerson. I'm a professor here at the University of California in Santa Barbara. I focus on the area of school psychology and I've been here for about 25 years. So I've reviewed a lot of applications and had the good fortune of working with uh, a, a tremendous uh, number of talented uh, graduate students over the past uh, few decades. So that's a little bit about me. I'll go ahead and turn it over uh, maybe to Dr. Wong. Oh, and you're muted still. Uh, yeah, that happens often, right? It's, you just forgot to unmute you first. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Mian Wang. Uh, I'm a professor in special education at UCSB. I'm also currently the chair for education department. It's very nice to meet you. And we're very excited about you know, introducing this program to all of you. And without further ado, I turn the, uh, I give the following time to uh, Dr. Jen Green. Hi, good morning. I'm Jen Green. I'm an associate professor in the special education program at Boston University. And I see some familiar names here. So I'm um, very happy to see um, so many people here this morning and to have a chance to talk to you about graduate school applications. And Gabby, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Gabby. I am in my first year at UCSB in the Counseling, Clinical, and School Psychology Department with an emphasis in school psychology. Excellent. Thank you all. And we'll go ahead and share some information about, uh, go, go through our agenda and share some information. So the first portion is highlighting the importance of increasing diversity in the fields of special education and school psychology. And this is a simple graphic illustration of the county level change in diversity since 2000. And when you look at this, it's important to consider the information that the, uh, is featured up in the legend there, that there's been a the, the yellow areas are those with low diversity, but big increases in diversity. So that's quite notable throughout the sort of um, northern and mid midwestern northeastern regions. There's also areas that have had high diversity with big increases, the, the lighter gray areas. There's also areas that have had high diversity and little change. So you can see that across the south, uh, throughout the south, the west, east, and, and midwest. And then importantly, there's only a few areas that show up in this really dark green, the low diversity, little change. So this is again, is since 2000, looking county by county, I believe uh, throughout the US, you can see that the diversity has been increasing and or continuing to remain very high in so many regions throughout the United States. And so this is part of the rationale for why it's so critically important that we prepare future faculty as well as scholars and practitioners and professionals to meet the needs of culturally and linguistically diverse children and families throughout the country. So in terms of demographic data on children in the US, 
it's notable that of the roughly 73 million uh, children from birth to age 17, 50% of the children are not white. Okay, so when we think about that in contrast to the population of school psychology and special education professionals, of the 500,000, roughly 500,000 professionals in special education and school psychology, this includes faculty and practitioners, only about eight to 15% are not white. So you could, you could remember this as roughly one in 10 being not white. And what when we look at the previous illustration of at least 50% uh, of the children in the United States being not white, we can see this disproportionate, uh, inconsistent sort of representation. So it's critically important for us to increase the number of faculty, as well as professionals who come from diverse backgrounds, really embracing the importance of having the cultural and linguistic diversity, the skills, the knowledge, the experiences that can both inform the research as well as advance the practice uh, within both areas of uh, school psychology and special education. Some of you might be familiar with the work of Scott Page and scholars in other fields have highlighted empirical studies that have illustrated the value of contributions of diversity in solving more complex problems. And in some ways, that's really what I think about when I think about the fields of school psychology and special education, is that we are tasked with solving some of the most complex problems that uh, we'll face within the fields of education and psychology. So for instance, uh, Scott Page has uh, synthesized a lot of this scholarship in several books that he's published during the past couple of decades. They're mentioned here on this slide. So for instance, the difference in, in the difference, this book uh, features how the power of diversity creates better groups, uh, firms, businesses, schools, as well as societies, looking and drawing upon the empirical literature to inform uh, this position. And uh, that information is featured in The Difference. The next book there that you can see, Diversity and Complexity, emphasizes how more diverse teams are more successful in solving more complex problems. And that's illustrated in a range of empirical studies and across a range of disciplines. And so utilizing this information clearly warrants further emphasis within the field of school psychology and special education. And then the other book that's noted here is the diversity bonus. And in the diversity bonus, it really highlights how diverse teams pay off in the knowledge economy. And when you look at this, whether it's computer science, whether it's banking, financial industry, uh, psych psychology, when you look at the empirical literature that this emerges from and is built upon, it, it truly highlights that solving these complex problems is advantaged by having individuals who come from diverse backgrounds and that's broadly defined. So including race and ethnicity, but also a range of uh, backgrounds and diversity. So diversity broadly defined. And then ultimately within the contemporary context, many of us are increasingly understanding and embracing the importance that um, advancing diversity in the fields is important and looking at it through a social justice lens and such, it's clear and understandable. However, it's as Scott Page notes in 2017, it's not just the right thing to do, it's the better thing to do. And again, highlighting from this series of books that he's written as well as others, really highlighting and featuring the value added of increasing the diversity and Clearly, we haven't yet seen a book that relates to the implications for providing services and supports for children and families, but clearly that would be an additional value added component. So again, uh, highlighting that it's not just the right thing to do, it's the better thing to do. So um, our objective collectively, and many of us speaking on behalf of many of us in the field, but certainly our teams at uh, UC Santa Barbara and Boston University have a clear objective to 
enhance diversity in the fields of school psychology and special education such that it will reflect the diversity of children in schools and continue to advance the scholarship, the research, the practice. Because again, as we prepare future faculty, they will take on leadership positions. They will engage in research and scholarship that will transform our knowledge, our understanding. And importantly, they will recruit, mentor, and prepare the next generation of professionals in the fields of school psychology and special education. So when we're thinking about this in terms of pipeline, uh, you know, facilitating the recruitment of uh, diverse colleagues and professionals from undergraduate programs or from master's degree programs into doctoral programs. When we think of that mentoring that will occur at the graduate school level or working with the undergraduates, and when we think about that research that's being developed, and when we think about that, the fact that this will help facilitate the provision of services, the science, the scholarship, that's ultimately where our commitment is in terms of our objective to uh, actualize diversity in the fields of school psychology and special education that reflects the diversity of children in schools. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Green and she can share a little bit of information here about Project Teams. So the four of us on this panel are all part of Project Teams, which is a grant that was funded by OSEP, which is the Office of Special Education Programs. And the grant is designed to form a collaboration between UC Santa Barbara and Boston University, focused on uh, preparing doctoral students to advance equity in the study of mental health among students. So as part of this Project Teams program, we'll be admitting three special education PhD students at UC Santa Barbara, three special education PhD students at Boston University, and three school psychology PhD students at UC Santa Barbara. And we'll be sharing a number of top tips with you today based on our own experiences over the past decade and two decades at UC Santa Barbara and at BU, um, but also wanna highlight that different universities and different programs have um, their own approaches and priorities. So we'll, we'll share our own experiences, but. Um, as you're applying, it's important to reach out to understand the priorities of different programs and universities that you're applying to. And I also just want to highlight that there's no, no perfect application and there's no right or wrong way to apply. This process is really about you getting to know programs and where you want to spend the next stage of your career development and for our faculty to get to know who you are through this process. So um, we hope that this information will be valuable to you. Um, this slide shows a list of some of the pieces of material and questions that we try to address and look at as we're uh, moving through the application process. And we'll go into more depth to talk about several of these on the next uh, bunch of slides on tips for you. But the characteristics or the, qual the materials that we typically evaluate are first um, fit with the department or program in terms of your research and professional goals. We want to make sure that we are well positioned to help you to meet your professional goals, um, your relevant work or research or internship experiences, your statement of purpose where you tell us who you are um, so that we can get to know you and your fit with our program, um, the letters of recommendation that you submit, your undergraduate experiences and employment experiences. And then we're also really interested in your patterns of academic study and field work and employment that, um, that you've had in the past and how they're relevant to your proposed graduate study. So not just what you've done, but how what you've done has um, moved you towards being ready to apply for doctoral programs and to understand your fit with our, with our programs. So our first tip is um, in your application materials that it's important to emphasize your unique strengths. So this isn't a place to hold back. We really want to understand the great things that you bring and we want you to tell us what those are. And it's important here that you explain your strengths. Um, for example, if you led a student activity group as an undergraduate, don't just tell us that you led the group, tell us why it was important and what that means about who you are and your strengths. And, um, and it's, it's really helpful for us when you can explain the strengths that you bring. And as Shane was talking about, increasing cultural and ethnic, racial and linguistic diversity among future faculty and professionals in both special education and school psychology is critical and essential to our mission and goals. 
So in your materials, please emphasize the cultural and the linguistic strengths that you contribute. And if you're applying to project teams, explain to us why you're committed to increasing equity in mental health services for students. It's helpful for us when your application shows a clear narrative of who you are and why you're applying to graduate school. So consider what each part of your application shows about who you are and what you bring to the table and how our graduate program can help you to achieve your goals. Okay, I'm gonna pick up uh, from uh, this slide and thank Jen and, and Shane for all your introduction. And I will continue with the, some of the tips and I wanna echo strongly with what Jen just said to you is we're not here in a position uh, kind of uh, mandating sort of a, this is the, something you have to do with your, your, your application. We're just suggesting these are the things that uh, we will you know, as a faculty, as a people who are gonna be in the admission or review committee, we'd like to see that uh, you uh, provide this information, you made emphasis in your uh, application material. So not only, Jen just mentioned, you should uh, in your personal statement as part of the application package to talk about your strength, right? Who you are, the work you have done, why you're enthusiastic about this program, and I also, for I, I guess it's true to many graduate programs, it's a people want to know, not only you, you are very interested in your program, you're enthusiastic about you know, coming to us, studying with us. And we want to hear a little bit about why you think this is a good fit, right? It's we know you are invest five, six years for a program, which is a very important part, not only for your uh, student life, it's a very important part to prepare yourself for your professional life. So, uh, you know, to talk about from your perspective, how, you know, your interest, you're enthusiastic on the topic and even the program nature, it's a really good fit to you, right? And then the good fit, I would uh, suggest you look at it from two aspects. One is about uh, how well you know our program and how you believe this is a perfect fit to what it what is uh, something that you'll be trying to do you know in the in the doc, uh, in the doctor program and that's kind of the first aspect about you the the fit between your interest and the program emphasis and try really do your homework and read what this program is really about and this is a really a, a innovative endeavor in some sort uh, between bu program and ucsb program right and we have Two programs at UCSB, uh, you know, there are two program, distinctive program, but they're uh, related very closely. So please study all the three programs and see uh, some of the features of the program. And so then make a decision about if, if you have really have a good fit and then try to elaborate that in, the, in your application. The other aspect of this good fit is really about knowing the people in the program. And that's always very important too, right? Not only you're interested in the program, you're also interested in the work of faculty member uh, in the program. So do your homework and, and, and read their work. And that's kind of uh, leading me to the, the next uh, slide. It's, uh, you know, don't feel hesitant to email uh, those faculty member you probably would like to consider as your prospective uh, advisor in the program. And I understand sometimes you just feel, wow, you know, I don't know this uh, professor, uh, you know, if I, you know, email him or her, uh, is, is he or she going to answer me? And then it's, it's, you may feel a little bit anxious or even uh, nervous about contacting faculty uh, member in the program. But I have to tell you from my personal experience or my experience of uh, interacting with many uh, Perspective student, I appreciate that uh, student who contact me first before even they apply the program, because again, for the for the reason we, we, uh, I and other colleagues uh, described earlier, is we really uh, pay attention to this goodness of fit, right? It's a we believe we have done uh, important work and we believe you are interested in our program, but also we want to see you put that in your your 
uh, application that uh, you you kind of uh, show us why you're the right person, right? Code and the code. So, and that's that means you know the question like uh, uh, why you wanna you know pursue a doctoral program and why uh, BU or why UCSB and why Professor uh, Green or Professor Jermis, uh, Jamerson or Professor Wong in the program. So, so that really means that even before you formally apply the program, try to, uh, you know, build some connection there. So, you know, if you only read the website, the website only give you limited information, right? Or even you go to professor's uh, resume and then look for a couple of publications, but that's still different from getting some, some connection with the professor and then start engaging, uh, you know, the thoughts you have for coming this program, what you would want to study about, and that really build sort of a, some uh, personal connection. Then you know the professor well, you know the program well. And demonstrate your success. Yes, uh, in addition to telling us uh, the strengths, uh, you know, as a student you have, and also try to uh, kind of uh, talk about the, you know, maybe the, the depends on how you define the, the success, right? The things is really like uh, Jane already touched upon. It's the work you have done before, the work not limited to coursework, and it's any project or any field-based work you have done that you believe that it's a, you really show the, number one the connection to the to the area uh, or the emphasis of the program, and the, in, in, on the other hand, it's also the work you've done that uh, would uh, really show the connection to even the line of research that the faculty member in the program are doing too, right? And then really talks about how your prior experience really also speak to your great potential, why you wanna come into this program and carry out some of the research project together uh, with other students and the faculty member. And of course, one of the things is as you talk about the success, uh, don't feel shy about talking how the things you have done in the past really indicate that your great potential for continuing any line of research uh, by joining this program. The next one, it's uh, the one you all know. Uh, it's important that you have a strong letters for any application. Uh, but here are just a couple of tips and also caveats we want to share with you is uh, you need to think about even at some point strategically about who you ask for a letter. And the things we look for a letter writer is really we want to, you know, from, from the uh, perspective of faculty member who are reviewing your, your application. So we want that letter writer really know, your, know you as a person and know your work well. So we don't want to like have quite a generic, nice letter just saying you're a good student, you're a good person. We want to know how, from this letter writer's perspective, they see your really your your potential, right? And then, particularly for uh, academic work, so really choose uh, wisely about who write the letter. Don't feel like you have to go to well-known scholar to write a letter. Uh, and sometimes they're busy or they don't know you that well, so they will write a kind of a as I said earlier, a very generic letter, which we don't really uh, get much, uh, you know, valuable information upon the letter. Rather, go to someone know your best, right? Go to someone know your best, and then can really speak on your, your potential, you're enthusiastic about the work you have done, and then something you want to continue uh, to do uh, through this program. But one uh, caveat is, uh, you know, yeah, your family member, your close friend know your pretty well, right? But they're not necessarily the best candidate for letter writer. So uh, again, think this uh, wisely and strategically, and, but strong letter is always an uh, important factor in the uh, application review process. Uh, let's see. I think I'm gonna turn back to Jim for more tips that she's gonna tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this next tip is to show your engagement with the field and research if possible. So with project teams, like many PhD programs, we are focused on preparing researchers 
And we want to make sure that we bring in students who are interested in research pathways or at least research as one potential pathway. So um, even if you don't have prior research experience, which is fine, we want to know that you are interested in spending four years working with us on research projects and that the research preparation that we offer is going to be a good fit for your career goals and something that you'll enjoy doing. So in your materials, um, describe your previous experiences related to special education, school psychology, child development, early childhood, all of these related experiences that you have and highlight for us how these experiences have prepared you for the next step in your education. If you have prior research experience, it's helpful if you can feature that experience, but above all else, we're looking for you to demonstrate real enthusiasm for the program that you're applying for. Uh, this next slide is on considering funding opportunities. So programs differ quite a bit in their funding structures. And one of the things that you can do is to review the program materials to identify the options for student support, including fellowships, teaching assistantships, research assistantships, and sometimes the deadlines to apply for those scholarships and fellowships are different from the main deadline for application. So keep an eye out for that. Admissions officers can be really helpful in navigating what the options are in terms of scholarships and funding and what the deadlines are for those. Um, in terms of project teams, we will be bringing in one cohort of nine fellows. So again, three in the special education program at UCSB, three in school psychology at UCSB, and three in special education at BU. Um, because of the grant, these, these slots are fully funded. So each project team's fellow will receive their tuition and fees completely covered at both universities, whichever university they're attending, as well as health insurance and a stipend um, for each academic year for four years. The stipend is $22,500 for each year. Um, in addition, we have funding for each fellow to have a new laptop and we'll be traveling between the two sites. So in one year, the UCSB fellows will travel out to BU and uh, for a week and spend a week visiting schools in Boston. And in another year, the fellows from BU will travel to UC Santa Barbara and spend a week visiting with uh, their, their fellow colleagues in UC Santa Barbara and touring schools and sites in Santa Barbara and around California. And in addition, we have funding for research in the summer, including um, an early summer start. So if you apply and are accepted, um, you can submit an application to be funded for research in the summer before next fall. We have funding for conference travel support to send our fellows to conferences in each year. And we have funding for a scholar exchange program in the final year of the program. So in the final year of the program, Scholars can apply to spend up to three months at the other university and working with faculty and other scholars at the other university. So those at UC Santa Barbara can spend up to three months in Boston and vice versa. Those in Boston could spend up to three months in Santa Barbara. And that's, that's optional, but an opportunity for that funding. And then we also have funding to support dissertation research of up to $5,000 per student. Gabby. Uh, okay, uh, so one tip is to start your application as early as possible. Um, sorry. Uh, gotta get my notes out for this. Okay, so start your application as early as possible. You need to develop a draft of your personal statement and then following further exploration of the program, you can modify and revise as you learn more about your career interest or your research interest. So starting early is very beneficial, making sure that you have um, everything done. Um, it's better to be done before, like in advance than the due date because you don't wanna be there the last night just trying to apply and something goes wrong with your computer or anything like that. So making sure you start early, you submit early, and that will take a lot of stress off, especially because all the due dates are around um, holidays. So it might be a little um, hard to balance both applications and spending time with your family. I don't know, did we have a slide for preparing for interviews? Okay, 
Perfect. So uh, most doctoral programs will review the application materials and then follow up with an interview. Getting an interview is not only excellent, but exciting. It reflects that the program faculty are interested in working with you. Preparing for these interviews helps to reduce your anxiety and to impress the faculty. The best way to prepare so that a person maintains poised composure is formulating questions and answers. Knowing how to respond to common interview questions and composing the best questions to ask an interviewer will help show genuine interest in that particular school. Instead of practicing a set speech, it is better to stick with a few points that explain your background and future goals. So to maintain a positive mindset for interview day, it is wise to get proper rest and eat a good meal before a big interview. At the same time you wanna impress the program, it is just as important that the program feels like a good fit for you. During the interview day, you also have to judge whether the professors and current students are people you actually wanna work with and spend the next five years and beyond with. Uh, lastly, it is important to let the organizers know if you need any specific accommodations for you to feel your best. We want you to have a good experience on the visit and we'll make efforts to help you be comfortable and successful. As mentioned, uh, Project Teams has travel funding and other programs sometimes do too. But at the same time, faculty understand if applicants choose to Zoom for reasons related to health and or finances. Um, some other um, tips is that admission officers can help. They're a great resource to learn more about the program. Um, I would also add that reaching out to students already in the program can be helpful as well. Uh, for me personally, I recently just went through this application process, um, so I'm always open to any questions that anyone may have. Um, additionally, there are many ways for students to enter career paths in special education and school psychology, and a doctorate is just one. So many of us know about different paths and are happy to chat with you about um, what you are considering and whether we think our program is a good fit. And lastly, I would add that um, you just need to make sure you take care of yourself during the application process. It's easy to forget about your mental and physical health when applying to grad school. Um, there's essays you have to write and deadlines you have to meet, but make sure somewhere in that busy schedule you're making time for yourself to exercise, go to therapy, and hang out with friends. Excellent. And as we uh, prepare for questions, as folks that are listening in might uh, have some questions, I'll also open it up to our panel. If there's other uh, thoughts that uh, any of us had during the presentation of information, and, and bravo, by the way, that was a lot of great information in a very uh, compact, short amount of time, which was our hope to be able to share this information succinctly this morning and also uh, facilitate uh, and encourage, provide opportunity for uh, individuals to uh, seek us out. And, um, and again, we can also answer questions at this juncture as well. I, I see that there's one question in the chat. There, you're, you're fine, you're welcome to put it into the chat. We've also listed a lot of resources in there that might be helpful for you with uh, links and such. You can also pose questions in the question and answers. But uh, I see one question from Jacqueline saying, do we apply directly to teams or are we considered when we apply? And that's an excellent question. In general, each of our programs will receive you know, a number of applications and it will be helpful to, for those individuals when you're applying to the special education program at Boston University or the special education program at UCSB or the school psychology program at UCSB, it will be helpful if you're able to highlight and specifically denote your enthusiasm as uh, Jen was describing and as Mian was describing about the goodness of fit, highlighting uh, your awareness of project teams. That's fantastic because as was noted, uh, these individual, the scholars who are admitted as fellows within the project teams uh, efforts will receive a tremendous amount of uh, funding and opportunities. So I would certainly encourage you to include uh, mention of project teams in your application materials. That would be very helpful. Um, and it could be that, um, well, it, it, there won't be necessarily a checkbox, at least on the UCSB front, uh, to, to add that indicator. So simply specifying it within your personal statement, information. There'll be lots of opportunities in the, uh, in the format of the information you'll provide where you could highlight uh, your interest and enthusiasm to be 
uh, part of the project team's uh, initiative, those scholars. What, do you feel similarly, Mian and Jen, or have other guidance? At, yes, at BU, it's, the, it's just the one application process. So it's the same application, regardless of whether you're applying to project teams or generally. And as Shane mentioned, if you just mention in the um, personal statement that you're interested in project teams and aware of project teams, then we will know to have make sure our project teams faculty take a look at your application. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to quickly add it's uh, even for UCSB side, right? You're going to fill out one form where there's a list of fact member that you will check the box where you indicate you probably there are your potential, uh, you know, prospect uh, fact member. Just don't just do that. It's in your uh, personal statement, other part really explicitly say, the reason also you choose to work with those faculty members is also the, not only their work, right? And also the, the connection they have with the uh, team project. So we kind of know that's the case. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. And as uh, colleagues were sharing during the, pro, the top tips, that uh, really thinking about that goodness of fit between your career aspirations and the emphasis of each of the programs you're applying to, I think that's so key because you know, some programs are preparing, you know, focused on preparing uh, future professionals. Some programs are focused on preparing future leaders. Uh, some are focused on preparing uh, future faculty members. Uh, obviously some, some are doing all of the above, but uh, for instance, with the project team's emphasis, there's a very strong focus on preparing the next generation of faculty leaders in the fields of special education and school psychology. So in general, we encourage you to really look carefully at each of the programs you're applying to. One other way that you can get insight sometimes is to look at the types of positions that graduates of that program have pursued. That's not always a absolute, absolutely clear indicator because uh, generally there's going to be uh, an assortment of uh, career opportunities that individuals will pursue. But if you know that uh, you're wanting to be uh, providing direct services after completing your doctoral program, it's important to look into that particular preparation within each of the programs you're applying to. If you know that you wanna go into leadership and administrative positions, then that would be important for you to look at. And equally important, if you want to become future faculty uh, member and scholar, uh, it would also be important to look at to what degree each of the graduate programs you're applying to have a strong emphasis on that preparation. And so, for instance, within the project teams context, there'll be tremendous support and mentoring really facilitating uh, that pathway of becoming future faculty members and leaders in the field, because with this uh, tremendous uh, resources and investment from U.S. Department of Education, on the uh, training grant that uh, Jen had described, the project teams looks to really help to facilitate and amplify these efforts of uh, advancing equity in mental health and really um, increasing the cultural and linguistic diversity of the faculty, as well as uh, meeting the needs of diverse uh, students, families, and populations in our schools and communities. So I would just mention those pieces as uh, each of you are considering all of the different opportunities and programs that you might apply to. And uh, let, another, another question that Damien had offered here is, what is an emerging research topic area of interest that may be beneficial for future PhDs in school psychology applicants to consider? And that's a great question. And in fact, I think we could cut this across special education and school psychology to begin with. There's a lot of overlap in our areas of emphasis. Um, and I would say just as a starting spot here, and then our colleagues and Gabby can also share what their perspectives are on this. One of the things that strikes me is that most areas of research and scholarship in terms of populations, uh, addressing challenges and problems within the fields of uh, education, school psychology, special education, uh, historically, there's been a relatively lack, uh, a relative lack of emphasis on uh, specifically looking at the application and advancing this knowledge among 
uh, children from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, uh, populations of children who are historically marginalized, minoritized. And, um, and so to some degree, most topics of interest would be very valuable in terms of applying that lens, um, applying a social justice lens and approach and using the most rigorous methodology, but really focusing on the sample populations that can help advance understanding of diverse, uh, diverse populations of children, not only those that uh, perhaps predominantly have existed within a lot of our literature. And also just noting the importance of engaging collaboratively with uh, colleagues and, for instance, with Boston University and UCSB, we have very different local populations of children and families, but by doing multi-site research, and certainly it can go beyond, you know, the East Coast and the West Coast, and we can collaborate with colleagues in the Midwest and the Southwest and the Northeast all throughout. In order to, uh, what I'm suggesting is in, in order to bring in more diverse samples of children and students and schools and contexts and neighborhoods and families, that doing research that incorporates this multi-site collaborative approach can also be very valuable. Um, and then also just thinking about the measures that we're utilizing, uh, sometimes the measures that we need to develop uh, because they don't yet exist, for instance, and also the unique uh, opportunities to advance knowledge and understanding with um, diverse populations of children and families that we might have some literature that talks about one or two populations, but we might, might not have other populations that are included. Um, you know, just one that comes to mind is indigenous youth and children and families is an area that certainly warrants uh, further emphasis uh, in our local community here in Santa Barbara. We have Chumash, uh, the Chumash tribes that uh, have been here historically, these lands. And so, that's just for example, but there's many, um, uh, the dual language learners, for instance, that's another incredibly important population about how we help facilitate their educational success. And the one other one that just stands out to me, which is what we're focusing on in earnest within project teams, is advancing equity in the support, uh, understanding and support services to promote children's social, emotional, behavioral, and mental health. And that intersect between social, emotional, behavioral, mental health and academic success and development and adaptation has been abundantly evident during the COVID-19 pandemic context. Uh, many families have come to really recognize that as well as education professionals because of the challenges that have presented for uh, many, many um, children across the um, different populations of children. So those are just a few thoughts, but I'll open it up. Maybe uh, Jen or Mian or Gabby might have additional uh, ideas related to that. Or not. Yeah, well, I just quickly uh, add, uh, Shane, is that uh, for, we, you know, there are probably a dozen of faculty members involved in this project from both BU and UCSB side. Mm -hmm. Also looking to what line of research they have been doing and currently are doing. And there, there's a really to uh, Dr. Jamerson's point, it's even they have other specific uh, professional or research interests, what really connecting this, uh, bridging this is about this common uh, interest on how the research we have been doing in the past really make unique contribution to this issue of, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's kind of in the core of special education, right? You, you think about special education research, really diversity and inclusion has been really the, the core that uh, in that. And then, of course, you know, there, if I understand the question, right, it's uh, probably you ask about any specific in terms of the, the topic of the area of research, yes. Then read those uh, faculty members who are involved in a project team and see the work they've done in the last decade and see kind of in that context, how the emphasis from this project on DEI would really connect well to things that the professor in this program has been doing. Excellent, excellent advice. And I see that Jen has been responding to a couple of questions in the chat, which uh, is fantastic. Thank you. It's great to have a dynamic team here and be able to uh, 
there's a lot of questions that have begun to emerge. So Jen was uh, taking a few of those that were straightforward there. So thanks, Jen. And you can see some of those answers related to GRE and the timing of uh, project teams cohorts that are in there. Um, a, a couple other questions. Uh, a student asked, um, if I plan to work for one year before applying to PhD programs, which means I have two years before applying, do you have tips on how to best allocate my time and plan for PhD applications in the long run. Anyone want to speak to that? I think because I think maybe I can answer that question and also um, try to answer Zoe's question at the same time. Um, because we're we're preparing students with a research background and students who are interested in research careers, it's helpful if. Um, you can demonstrate some interest in research. So even if you don't have prior research experience, which is not a requirement, it's not a requirement to have previous research experience, um, we want to know that you're going to enjoy and be engaged in um, research for, for four to five years in our program. So um, we, we want to um, be pretty convinced that this will be a, a good place for you in that way and that, um, and that the research preparation that we're offering will help you to get to where you want to go eventually. So if you are um, taking off some time before applying to a PhD program, trying out some research and seeing if it's something that you enjoy and if it's a good fit for you and which pieces of it you like and don't like, um, I think is helpful if you're considering applying for a PhD program. Um, and Zoe, to answer your question, we, um, we do have students who come without research experience but, um, but who make the case for why they think research is, is really important to them and where they want to be going with their careers down the road. Yeah, I would also add, um, I think uh, Joaquin asked in the Q&A, what does support look like for candidates that don't have the strongest background in research? Um, you will learn a lot. You don't have to be the best researcher in the world to come into this program. You will learn a lot. But it is also, like um, Dr. Green said, to get that experience beforehand so that you know that this is what you really like to do and that's you want to spend the rest of your life researching and um, contributing to academia. So making sure you have that experience beforehand will be very beneficial because you don't want to be in the program doing something you don't like. Um, so. I highly recommend getting involved either with professors at your current university or um, there's plenty of opportunities online to contribute to uh, other labs across the country as well. Shen, there's an, I noticed there's a question in Q&A about uh, you know, prior experience in other country related to school psych. I guess probably you're in the position of addressing that. Yeah, certainly. I saw that one in there. It's certainly exciting because uh, that's one of my areas of emphasis is international school psychology or the application of our uh, knowledge in the field of school psychology, educationally, uh, education, uh, educational psychology internationally. And I, I know that Mian also does a fair amount of work uh, focused on the area of special education internationally. So we do have those these strengths among our faculty and certainly would uh, welcome colleagues uh, and you know, graduate student applications who have an interest in, in that, these areas. Um, for the purpose of project teams that does restrict uh, the fellows, the actual individuals receiving the funding, the fellows are restricted to uh, US citizens or those that have permanent residency and such. So that is one uh, element for consideration with project teams, but in general, um, our universities embrace and engage many international students that are not U.S. citizens and or uh, permanent residents. And so you shouldn't uh, have that limit your sort of possibilities with there's other types of funding that's available through each of our programs that could help to facilitate that. But yeah, there is a definite uh, opportunity to um, have scholarship. We have projects. Uh, if you look at my, my publications, for instance, uh, You'll see a number of research projects that we've done, including up to you know, 20 different countries around the world. Um, we've published numerous papers with colleagues throughout the world. We have current projects underway. And so to the degree that you're interested in uh, thinking about the development, research, application of school psychology or special education internationally, uh, certainly, I know here at UCSB, we have faculty and scholars who have particular strengths uh, in these areas. 
So for the project teams, it's not a perfect fit because of the funding piece, but don't let that stop you from applying to graduate programs where you see a really great fit because there's also other sources of support uh, for all of our graduate students um, at Boston University and UCSB that, that go beyond project teams as well. So um, project teams is great. It's exciting, but it's not, it doesn't define us and it's not everything that we are. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, in terms of the questions that have been popping up, I know that there's been quite a few and um, Jen had uh, responded to several here. Just want to make sure that uh, in terms of applications due, that one popped up again. I put it in the chat up above and I uh, could probably also go back to that slide real quick, but the um, applications are due for UCSB School Psychology has the earliest due date, which is 1115. Okay, and if you look in the chat up above, there's a direct link so you can get easy access. UCSB Special Education PhD program is uh, December 1st, which is the same as the Boston University Special Education program, PhD program, December 1st. So that's an excellent question. And thanks for asking that again, because I know we were sharing information in the chat as individuals were presenting top tips. So I know it's not always possible to uh, do all the multitasking and get all the good information, but hopefully that's helpful. Um, and uh, let's see if there's other ones that Gabby or me and or Jen um, noted. Um, Oh, okay. What methods are being used to recruit students uh, from diverse backgrounds into school psych and special ed programs? You know, I think that there's a range of strategies, both within our efforts, as well as other colleagues I know. Um, for instance, I was just at the California Association of School Psychologists Conference the past uh, couple of days down in Orange County. And there was a lot of uh, discussion among faculty about outreach efforts into um, institutions that, for, for instance, uh, historical, historically Black colleges and universities, uh, Hispanic-serving institutions, uh, Anapaisi in, institutions, uh, really looking to recruit uh, students from diverse backgrounds by um, seeking out um, some of the institutions where the, the students might be most likely to be attending uh, as undergraduates. And for instance, at UCSB, we're fortunate because we have a very large uh, population of diverse undergraduates as an HSI and uh, Anapaisi and multicultural serving institution. But it's really those sort of communications and outreach, but also including things like social media and trying to get the word out and trying to welcome individuals and, in, and not just welcome, but invite, <laughs> invite and seek out. Um, so some of you might be familiar with like the McNair Scholars Program or the Sally Casanova programs. Uh, there's lots of different uh, Promise Scholars programs. There's lots of different um, initiatives that have been in existence uh, for, for decades. And really trying to provide those students with information about opportunities in the fields of special education and school psychology being so important because some folks realize they want to work with children or help children, but they might not be as aware of special education and school psychology. So we need to be able to get that information out, do that outreach uh, to, to the various um, community colleges to the uh, undergraduate programs um, and especially within communities where the vast majority of the students uh, attending the colleges would be from uh, historic culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds those are just a few things that i was thinking of wow there's a lot of great questions coming in this is awesome <laughs> somebody see another one they want to grab uh, as i was answering that one i got distracted from seeing all the uh, other elements I think maybe Damien's uh, would be a good one for you to answer, Shane, um, oh. because it's about school psychology. Oh, OK. Are there any hints or tips, suggestions for a mid-career professional working in a different education area, higher education, who wishes to pursue a PhD in school psych? Is that the one you noted, Jen? Yeah, so we are embracing that there's a lot of pathways to the doctoral programs in special education and school psychology. And I will point out, by the way, for those of you out there who are practicing school psychologists and or have a master's degree in school psychology, you might also consider going into a doctoral program in special education. Like that's a thing, there's a path there and you would be exceptionally well prepared to apply and be competitive. So don't necessarily uh, just limit yourself to a linear path of like, uh, oh, I went to 
I, I'm a school psychologist or I went to be, you know, in a master's program or specialist program for school psychology. So therefore I must go into a doctoral program in school psychology. You might, you may, you might, and I, I wouldn't discourage it, but I'd also encourage you to think about the paths into special education. And likewise, if you're a special education teacher or you have a special education master's degree, you may consider applying to the school psychology doctoral program. So this can really go both ways. And in terms of that question about hints or tips for that mid mid career professional, um, in terms of uh, getting yourself oriented about the types of top tips that were mentioned earlier and really trying to clearly articulate in your personal statement about where you see the tremendous opportunity for you to bring that wealth of knowledge and experience to bear upon addressing and advancing the research and scholarship in within a doctoral program context. If you're not applying to a program that has a strong emphasis on preparing you know, faculty and scholars, well, then you can really emphasize that if you want to get the degree to then advance into leadership positions within um, education and have that doctorate for those purposes, you can also highlight that for those programs. So again, depending upon your ambitions, your aspirations, and what you've determined that the program has to offer, then really emphasize that within your materials, like Mian was saying. And again, this is whether or not you're special education or school psych, mid-year, mid-career professional. And, and absolutely, there are individuals who come back into our doctoral programs after working as a special educator or school psychologist or teacher, for that matter, you know, maybe for 10 years, maybe they did that for 15 years. And at that point in their career, they know they want to do uh, something they want to do the doctoral program so that they can do something different in terms of fulfilling their career aspirations. And that actually relates to another question that I did see earlier. These programs that we have to offer are um, full time, in person, full immersion programs. And um, I believe that's true for both Boston University. I know it's true for UCSB. There are a few programs out there for those of you that are seeking. Um, seeking sort of uh, distance or remote sort of doctoral programs. There are a few. And if you emailed, if you emailed us, we could possibly direct you. There are, no, there are not a lot of them. Most of the doctoral programs are full-time in person. Uh, but I am aware of a few, at least in school psych, that offer a remote uh, piece because I think that was a question up above. Uh, so one of the questions was, can, are you welcome to submit your GRE scores? And the answer for UCSB is no. So um, some institutions have taken on a position of GRE scores optional. And I believe this is true, Mian. Actually, I know it for CCSP, but I, I guess we, I think it's true for um, special ed as well that they're not allowed to submit. So there's just not even a place to submit. Is that correct for you as well, Mian, in special ed admissions? Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening next year, but so far is it's not required, but they can submit oh. online, you know, as part of the, the application package so far. Okay. So, so I'm not sure if there's ed. any new policy for, for next year, but I yeah. will assume probably if you want, you can you can submit. Yeah. For special education, just what me and said, right? For school psych, not not an option. What about you, Jen at Boston U? Option or no? It is an option to submit it. It's not required so you there is a spot where you can submit it if you'd like to but we we don't we don't always really look at them because it's not required and many of our students don't actually submit them anymore I'd say the majority don't submit GRE scores at this point right okay so that's the great thing about having all three of us here is that we can actually answer that question intelligently because obviously if I was answering it I would have misanswered it for the three three different programs even though two of us are at one one university so that's awesome thank you what other questions are you seeing in there Gabby or Mian or uh, Jen I know we're coming down to maybe the last uh five or eight minutes so we're not in a rush but I know there's a yeah. lot of questions there's one specific question on statistical knowledge that I want to prepare. I want to address that in a, a greater context. Yeah, we definitely, you know, you need to talk about your prior knowledge and, and, and the experience, right? But you're not, you don't have to know a lot of statistics before you join the program, very much like uh, Jen and, and Shin said before. And we have a strong 
uh, research method components, you know, within our program. I use a special ed program at UCSB as an example. You have to take five method course and they're required. A lot of our students even doing more than that. And then you learn both quantitative and qualitative research method. So if talking about a specific statistical program, uh, we are using R, we used to use uh, SPSS data, but now we're using R. So you're gonna learn that. You don't have to learn it ahead of time. And then if you wanna do advanced research course, uh, for let's say for structure equation modeling, we're using M plus. So that's kind of only the software that you learn to really help you, you know, apply those research methods. So the, there's a strong components within a program that you're gonna be trained for doing that well. So no worry, any, any statistic knowledge you have, that's good. You can probably include that in your application material. The, the same is true at BU. We um, have people coming in with a very wide range of different backgrounds. R is another statistical software program um, that's different from SPSS, but um, our stat and SPSS are all different software programs and our students come in with a very wide range of knowledge and we don't expect any particular knowledge of any software programs or any statistics. Um, as Mian was saying, we prepare you with that once you get here. Yeah, same. Okay, uh, there was a question about individuals who have a developmental background and that certainly resonates with me. Uh, I had pursued uh, developmental psychology at the Institute of Child Development and then in thinking about the uh, application of science, which is really what my passion is, is to bring science to practice to benefit children and families. And schools tend to be where most children are most days. So I actually see special education and school psychology in particular as tremendous opportunities to actualize social justice because we are there with most children most days. And so in terms of having that developmental emphasis, and looking to bring that developmental psychology, child development knowledge and science to practice, that's what actually attracted me to the field of school psychology. And it was actually special education faculty who initially I had taken some courses from at the University of Minnesota. And so uh, Stan Dino is a very senior uh, special ed colleague who had done some curriculum, well, did kind of established curriculum-based measurement uh, way back in the day, as well as some other areas of emphasis. And in taking a course that, uh, that he was offering, I was uh, at that time in the child development program at the Institute of Child Development. And I was asking these other uh, graduate students what programs they were in. And it turns out they were all in special education or school psychology. And so I uh, had the good fortune of being able to also uh, pursue the school psychology. I ended up choosing the school psychology as an additional uh, doctoral program at uh, University of Minnesota. And so those of you who come to this with a developmental background, that's absolutely strongly competitive, um, as well as teachers. You know, the, those of you who have had a teaching credential, perhaps, um, that's a very strong skill set and foundation to launch into either special education or school psychology. Um, as I'm thinking this through, I'm every instance of where I was describing developmental psychology, teaching, um, whether you're school psych, whether you're special ed, I can think of individuals that we've admitted into our doctoral program in school psychology who have absolutely flourished and, and it, they brought with them all of those tremendous experiences um, in these different areas. So certainly, again, don't worry about it being a linear path. Don't worry about just being school psych, more school psych, more school psych. Don't worry about just being special ed, more special ed, more special ed. If you come from other uh, backgrounds, again, once again, that's another dimension of diversity that you would be contributing because we're defining diversity broadly, right? And embracing diversity broadly. Yeah. Yeah, well, I just want to quickly resonate with Shane. And I mean, very much like you, Shane, I'm trained first as a developmental psychologist. So, and then I uh, fell in love with special ed. So I kind of, uh, really have done like more work in the special education field, but, but and also for our program, for special ed program at UCSB, uh, development always being an important aspect of our program, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we have a strong foundation um, in all of our programs on development. So those of you that are out there that come from a developmental psych or child development background, we absolutely welcome your applications and uh, super enthusiastic and in our, graduate programs, we have a strong emphasis. And as you've already gleaned, 
uh, a number of faculty who actually had focused on that uh, pr uh, prior to their current contemporary emphasis on school psych or special ed. So, yeah, and and in some degree, I think of special ed and school psych as I think about I think about myself as like an applied developmental scientist. I see these fields as applied um, as applied science, and so. It is interesting in terms of our discussion here and thinking about the question that prompted it, that uh, what we're doing out there is trying to, and it's also the intersect with systems though. I mean, to be fair, when we work within the fields of special education and school psychology, that knowledge of child development and that, that, that focus is really a critical piece. However, because of the nature of schools as a context, as systems, that to me is that unique preparation that kind of blends the combination and, and really takes advantage of those numerous strengths and uh, knowledge domains and areas of expertise. So, um, you know, clearly it is about the child development aspect. I mean, fundamentally, I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to facilitate these children's uh, social, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, uh, competencies and addressing challenges uh, as they may emerge, and especially among children with uh, disabilities, uh, taking a strength-based, solution-focused, problem-solving approach, and, and really trying to utilize our research and science to help support these children within the systems of schools, <laughs> right? And, and understanding that there, that, that varies. There are some legislative uh, aspects, there's some legal aspects, and then there's the reality of systems uh, and doing systems change work and, and working with collaboratively with our general education, special education, as well as school psych administrators and leadership. Um, so, so all of that together, that's, that's what it got me thinking about. Um, so I know a few folks have put in their emails there. That's fantastic. I see Gabby did already and uh, Jen did, and it looks like... Uh, it looks like we're just about out of time. Was there any one other question in there that uh, any of you had noted that we didn't get a chance to answer either via verbally or um, with all the great responses that folks have been providing in the chat? Um, I think one it was from Pauline. She just asked if there are any components of the application that you, you feel um, faculty pay more attention to than others, like the statement of purpose, personal statement, um, just, yeah. I'll let someone else answer that. I've talked a lot. So I, I tried to answer that, Pauline, for BU. We only require a personal statement. We don't require two separate statements. And um, where we do pay a lot of attention to the personal statement, because that's where we're looking to understand who you are and um, why you're applying and why for BU, why you're interested in BU and why you're interested in a PhD and why you're interested in our special ed program and why you're interested in working with our faculty. So we're really looking to understand how we can support you in the next stage of your professional development um, through that statement. So I, I think that that's the piece of the application that we pay the most attention to, although we we obviously look at everything. That's the piece that we're, where we're really looking to understand who you are and where we fit into your, your journey. I agree with that for UCSB. Well said, Jen. Same. Ditto. Okay. Well, I know uh, we've already taken up uh, an hour of your time today, maybe a little bit more, but uh, we want to express our gratitude for you joining with us today. And we hope that some of the information or resources that we've shared have uh, might be valuable uh, along your journey, as Jen described, uh, as you're considering applying to doctoral programs in special education or uh, school psychology. And we hope that uh, this topic and emphasis on increasing the racial and cultural diversity of faculty and professionals in these fields will resonate with you and that many of you will join us to be the change in advancing uh, the diversity and uh, facilitating the future of the field. Many of you could be the future leaders in the field. So we hope that some of the tips that we shared will help to facilitate your uh, application exploration process and your competitive uh, opportunity. And as was noted, uh, feel free to uh, send us emails if you have more questions or want to share additional information, we're, we're available. And we look forward to 
reviewing some of your application materials and looking forward to meeting some of you at conferences in the future if you don't end up uh, choosing or uh, being admitted to UCSB or Boston University because they are relatively small fields, uh, special education and school psychology. And so we hope that if we cross paths on an escalator or in a hallway at a conference, you'll uh, mention and say hello and perhaps uh, indicate whether this was a helpful part of your journey. So thank you. And thank you to uh, Dr. Green, Dr. Wong, as well as uh, Gabby today for sharing such tremendously valuable information. And we wish you the best, wishing you health, wellness, and well-being. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Okay.